Someone mentioned something that we talked about last time. Other than the syllabus and that kind of stuff. I could just see the first person, your syllabus had your phone number on it. The second person's syllabus had your email address on it. <laughs> no, not, not that kind of stuff. Once we started it on the actual Java stuff, can someone mention anything that we had talked about? Yes. Okay. Uh, updating your PC so that you can run Java. What, what was a key component about that? There's a couple key thoughts as far as that goes. Google, <laughs> Google yeah. That's a key thought for everything. Uh, <laughs> um, does anyone have more specific? Yes. Correct. First of all, that, that you're looking at the JDK and not the JRE. All right, you're liable to have the JRE anyhow, even if you're not doing Java development. That's one key thing, that you're installing the JDK. What's the second kind of thing? The path. Make sure that you are likely going to have to set your path, because even if you install it, you have to tell the operating system where to find these programs. And why is it going to do it for you? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, one possibility is it's possible to have multiple versions of Java on your machine for whatever, whatever reason. And by forcing you to configure the path, it allows you to choose which version you want to compile under. So that may be one reason why um, the path is not automatically set. I don't know. Um, the thought probably is, is that if you are a, someone that's going to be doing Java development, you're able to figure out how to change your path. So <laughs> that's probably the real reason why that it wasn't worth the time. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Was there, was there a better class up there? Maybe we'll all go up there. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, make sure you set your path. Um, anything else that we remember from last time? Mac users didn't have to set a path. Mac users didn't have to set a path. All right. <laughs> anything else? Can't use plain text editor. Yes. Correct. There's going to be two files, and what are those two files? The class file is one, and what's the other one? The .java, the source, right. And just to use some terminology here, um, just to be clear on terms, um, because it's important, I think, to use the right terms, Here's the way the process of writing and, and running a Java program is. This is assuming that you've already have Java installed. You create one or more than one source file. And it's going to have a name of the class name, whatever your class is, dot Java. So I'll put class in quotes, indicating that it's, it's your actual class name, not the word class. Unless your class is named class, which I would avoid doing because that would just make it too confusing. All right, I'm just, all right never mind. <laughs> so that's your source. Whenever you hear someone in computing uh, talking about source code, source code is the code that people work on. It's the code that people write and work on. That's to distinguish from sometimes called object code or sometimes called machine code. Machine code is the code that the computer actually executes. All right? Computers don't natively understand Java, even if Java is, un even if Java is, is um, installed. The, the instructions for the chipset is called machine code. And machine code is like the real nitty gritty ones and zeros, that kind of stuff. But it's very, very, very difficult for humans to work with, for people to work with. So there's these intermediary steps that sort of bridges the gap, giving you a language that's easier for people to understand and yet still can be translated into uh, the machine code. And back in the old days, 
like if, if you talked about like a Fortran or a COBOL program, that would be compiled and would produce machine code or object code slash machine code. And that was the code that the computer actually executed. In the case of Java, it's a little bit different. And that difference is important because it, it brings out one of the strengths of Java. In Java, when you compile the code, you produce a class file. This is the second file that we talked about. And it ends in dot class. All right? And this is what's called byte code. It's sort of like machine code, but it really isn't. Actually, it's virtual machine code. Because there's sort of an extra level with Java between the actual machine itself. The machine runs a Java virtual machine. And the virtual machine runs the Java bytecode. All right. So we have our source file, which is written in Java. That's what's understandable for humans. All right. Um, that has all the instructions. What we saw last time was that. That goes through a compile process to produce what is called bytecode. This file ends in .java, this file ends in .class. More or less, again, sometimes I speak in general terms, you know, we will be able to find exceptions to this. More or less, there's going to be, at least for the first part of the class, a one-to-one -one correspondence between these. There'll be a source file for every class, and every one of these files will compile to one of these. Later on in the semester, that may vary up a little bit. There's, there's a handful of exceptions. But for the most part, one of these corresponds to one of these. There'll be one of these for every class in your application. And initially, for Monday and probably for the rest of the day today, we're talking about just one class only. Our program is just in one class. All right? And that will compile to bytecode. And the bytecode is what the actual virtual machine runs. All right? So the advantage of this, what is the advantage of this, by the way? What's the advantage of having that Java virtual machine and that extra step in the process of having Java bytecode? Um, that might come into play a little bit, but, but that's not really the reason why this was done. Could, in other words, we compiled Java and produce machine code right away that the machine executes? Of course we could. We put a person on the moon, we can do that, right? But we don't. We create this byte code. We create sort of an intermediary step. The reason for the intermediary step is that you can have different virtual machines for different hardware. And you can run the same, at least theoretically, you can run the same Java bytecode on different hardware without having to recompile. If we recompile, if we compiled in the machine code, that code would be specific to a type of machine. And therefore, if we wanted to run it on a different type of machine, we'd have to recompile and produce machine code for that kind of machine. All right? But with Java, we don't have to. You can give the byte code. And the virtual machine does sort of that second level of translating to translate the byte code into the actual machine code. Yes? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm actually talking about hardware at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm focusing on, on the literal, actual machine. All right. And, and the ability to be cross-platform is really a big selling point of Java. I know things are changing in the Windows development world, but really, 
for a long time, that was a big selling point of Java. That Java, you write once, run anywhere. All right, so you write it, compile it, you can distribute it, as long as someone has a proper version of the Java virtual machine for their particular platform, they can run it. All right, I suppose operating system does come into play um, somewhat um, for this as well. All right. How do we compile a Java? Yes, go ahead. Well, that's a great example. There would be a different Java virtual machine for a 64-bit versus 32-bit, and you would not have to recompile it. And so that would be an example of an advantage. So you create the, the, the class files, then what would be different would be this. This is what makes it cross-platform compatible, is the fact that you have a different one of these for every environment that you're talking about. How do we compile a Java program? What's the command to do it? Java C. And we put in the name of the class, whatever it is, dot Java. If we've done it correctly, what do we get? We get a class file with that class. How do we run that class file? No. Java and the name of the class name. All right, keep in mind we're doing all this in the command line. And I, I've had people complain about doing this. Um, and they don't understand I'm doing it this way on purpose. All right, and again, it's not to make your life miserable. All right? I'm not just doing this to, to make your life miserable. I, I firmly believe that, again, I'm trying to, I'll try to say this without sounding too much like an old man that's going to, take your baseball if it rolls into my yard or, or something like that. But a problem with IDEs is IDEs protects the developer from knowing some of the details and some of the nuts and bolts and some of the important stuff in learning a tool, all right, in learning a, a programming language and a platform. And therefore, if you do things with just a text editor and command line, I really think you understand things on a much, much deeper level. Then when you have an IDE to use, well then, okay, you understand the basics, you understand the, the root, the nuts and bolts, and you can use the IDE for all the great things that the IDE provides for you. Now you don't have to use Notepad. I use Notepad simply because it's what's, I, I know it's on every machine, so I can just pop it open without worrying about is this installed or that installed. Um, some people like, for example, uh, Notepad++ because that color codes stuff and that shows you like the matching braces, which is an important thing because that's certainly one of the things that can go wrong is if you forget a brace. Um, there's a, an editor called Komodo, which I think you can use for Java. I've used it for web development, but I think you can do use that for others. And there's Text Wrangler. So there's a number of free uh, options that, that are very good. And, you know, pick one. But we're not going to use, at least at the beginning of the class, something like Eclipse or, or um, any other sort of IDE. All right, let's download the code that we have, and let's essentially recreate the process that we did last time. And um, then go further and look at it. Because if I remember right last time, I ran it, and we looked a little bit about the contents of the code, but we didn't spend a lot of time. There's a few things that we had um, that would benefit going over again. And then we'll build on that, and we'll add stuff to it. All right, I am going to copy all this.
and I'm going to open up my text editor, and you're not seeing this, but I just went to Canvas and, and copied the example that we looked at last time. I'm going to go into my text editor, and I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to save it. And the way you save it as you have to change this to all files, because otherwise it will save it as a .txt file. And then we give a name, and the name should match the name of the class. So the class is Hello World, and so the name should be Hello World.java, with the same sort of capitalization. And those of you that are running Windows, sometimes Windows is forgiving if you don't capitalize things in the exact same way. Like if you save it in a file called Hello World that's not capitalized. That's a bad habit to get into because the world is not 100% Windows. There will be other environments where the capitalization does matter. So you should uh, follow the rules of capitalization. So if your class is Hello World with capital H, capital W, then your file name should be Hello World with capital H, capital W. As a rule, names of classes are capitalized. All right. Um, keep in mind that in addition to like the programming rules of Java, there's like conventions that are followed. Um, so you could make a class with a lowercase h, but that would be frowned upon. Um, a nice thing at looking at um, code where you follow these conventions as you immediately understand. If you've, you've been using these conventions, it helps the understanding of it. If you see hello world somewhere and you notice it's capitalized, it's like, ah, that's a class. All right, where in other instances, if you didn't follow those conventions, it wouldn't necessarily be as obvious. All right, so I'm going to save it as hello world.java. It is on my desktop. I am going to go to the command line in Windows. You can do that by typing in CMD. I have to get in the proper folder to compile this. All right. Again, if you're not, um, you know, you don't have to know tons of command line stuff in this class, but um, you should know some basic things. One of them is how to get in a folder. One of them is how to get a directory listing. All right. Um, in this case, I am in C users lab instructor. So lab instructor is my username. If I do a DIR, I will see the list of things that are in uh, my folder. And my desktop is actually simply a folder underneath my username. So if I'm in this folder and I want to get in the desktop, I type in CD desktop. So you're going down a tree, essentially. All right. CLS is useful. It clears your screen. A couple other things are useful. You can use the arrow keys to back up through commands. That's very useful if, for example, you're editing a program and you are um, um, running it, you know, editing it, trying something, running it, seeing the results, edit it again, run it again, um, to use the arrow keys to recompile it rather than having to type in the whole command in. All right, I'm going to go and I already saved this. I'm going to close it. If I right mouse on it, I can say edit and it will open it up in Notepad. Now, one thing you'll notice is the icon on the desktop says hello world.java. All right. You should be showing your file extensions. Um, Windows hides file extensions because most sort of average users don't really care about file extensions. They just need to know like what program opens up what file. But you as a developer, you should go in, and this will vary depending on the version of Windows you have or the version of the operating system, and you should make sure, I clicked on the wrong thing, folder and search options, view. Yeah, you should make sure that the file extensions are not hidden, so you can see the full file name to make sure 
Because um, otherwise, hello world.java and hello world.class would look the same, right? I mean, because if you don't see the file extension, they'd both simply be called hello world. All right. So now I'm ready to compile it. I can type in Java C. Hello world. Dot Java. It doesn't tell you if it works. <laughs> it just simply finishes. But if it finishes without giving you any error messages, that's a good thing. And just to be double sure, I'm going to do a DIR again. And we'll see that there are two files. There's a hello world.java, which is my source code, and a hello world.class, which is my byte code. The byte code is what the virtual machine actually runs. All right? It's not in people readable form. So if I were to look at that, it would just be a bunch of garbage characters that I wouldn't be able to, to parse through. To run it again, I simply type in Java. Hello world. And it goes and does its thing and gives me my answer. And there you go. This should largely be review. All right? Any questions about any of this? I would hope everyone could do this. If I gave everyone a blank machine that didn't have Java installed, I would hope that after what we did on Monday in the lab and a little bit of review today, that you'd be able to go, find a JDK, install it, set your path, I know you don't know how to write the code yet, but copy the code in this case, create your .java file, compile it, get your class file, and then run it. If you can do that at this point, you're OK. All right? Now, let's spend some time looking at the comment, uh, looking at the code. First of all, you'll notice there's a good chunk of code that is commented out. All right? This whole block of code is not code. This doesn't get put in the bytecode. This is, this is not meant for the machine to execute. This is only meant for humans reading this. It's, it's extra explanation. And some organizations have standards about like what you should put. Like every class file should have such and such at the beginning of it. Who wrote it? The date that they modified it. Sometimes there's like a revision history on it. Like you know, on such and such date we. We corrected the spelling of hello or whatever. All right? But this is meant for uh, the computer, uh, or this is not meant for the computer, this is meant for the person programming it. Now you can do comments two different ways, and this is the same as C sharp, so I'll just briefly mention it. If any of you aren't sure, we can, uh, I can review it. But you can either do comments to comment out an individual line, you start with slash slash. To comment out a block of lines, slash star indicates the beginning of comments. And way at the end here, star slash indicates the end of the comments. So if you have a bunch of comments, that's the easier way to do it than to do the slash slash. Really doesn't matter which you prefer. Um, it is a good idea to comment these because commenting your code makes it more readable. And more readable means it's more maintainable. All right. Just about every class I teach, I talk and I, I talk about and I emphasize the need for maintainability. It's very, very, very rare that you're going to write a program and never look at it again. All right? For any number of reasons, right? Maybe there's a bug in it. Maybe you did something wrong. Maybe um, they, want, they, like the, they love the program so much they want to add new stuff to it. Maybe something about the business or the law has changed, and you need to take that into account. You know, maybe the way that income taxes are calculated changed. So whoever wrote the payroll program has to go in and, and make those kinds of changes. So even if you do a perfect job, even if there aren't any bugs, there's reasons that you need to go in and change your code. And therefore, a lot of what we do as developers is to write the code in such a way that it's easy to maintain. 
And this can be big things, this can be little things. This is, these are big things like designing what classes, designing, designing what methods, and so on. And little things like commenting your code, indenting your code properly. All those things are things that ultimately will help to maintain ability of your code. All this code could be on literally on one line. I could simply have one line of code that has all this stuff in it with no line returns, with no indenting, anything like that. As long as the, the syntax of the code was correct, the way that it spaced out wouldn't matter to the computer compiling or running this code. But it's going to matter to me. If this was all on one straight line, it would be very difficult for me to understand and analyze what's going on here. All right? So we do things like we indent. All right. Let's look at this. This is a very simple class. It only has one method in it, method and function being the same thing. I'll probably use them interchangeably. First of all, we have the class declaration. Remember, this is going to match the name of the file with a .java at the end. It's going to have the word class before it, indicating that it's a class. For the first few weeks of the course, everything we do is going to be a class, but there are other things that you can have besides classes, so you have to identify what it is. And public relates to who can use this class. And again, for the first few weeks of, of, of this course, the classes we create, we're going to make it so everyone can use them. All right? You can make classes, um, you can make classes public. You can make classes private, you can, uh, and then there's a third option. All right? You can do the same thing with methods. You can do the uh, same thing with attributes when we talk about attributes later on. All right? You can make them public, private, or protected. And public is the first one that we're looking at, and that simply means that anyone can access this class and can access the method within it. All right? Later on, we'll look at why you would change that. All right? Um, but for now, public. And when I say anyone, I mean a computer or a, another program or something like that. One of the things that we're doing in this, uh, in this course, we're going to do is we're going to create sort of um, components that you can use. We might write a component for a dice, for example, or a die. Right? And we might write games that roll that die. All right? um, ideally, we're not going to have to write the code about how to roll a dice and, and what the result is and all that. We're not going to have to do that every single time we write a game that involves dice. We write the code for a dice, for a die, one time. And then we reuse that over and over again. All right? But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a public class, which means that anyone can run it, which means that I can compile it and I can run it from the command line. All right? Every application you write needs to have at least one class that has a main method in it. All right? Main. And all main methods look the same. They're public, which means they can be accessed freely, which you know, makes sense if this is the code that you're running, you want other people to be able to run it. It's static, which we're not going to talk about right now, but it's important to note, you can just memorize it for now, that your main method is going to be static. Void, what does void signify? It signifies that it doesn't return anything. All right. Functions can have return values. And return values are things like the answer to a question. I could have a, re I could have a method that says, um, calculate this person's gross pay. This is the number of hours that they work. This is their wage rate. And it would do the math, and it would return the answer. Well, not all functions return something. If you see void, it means that this function doesn't return a value. We'll see examples later on where we do have a function that will return values. 
Functions, again, are, are a way of grouping a set of instructions together. And why do we create functions? Well, why do we do a lot of things? Maintainability. You'll learn in this class that if I ask why do we do something, you don't even have to hear the rest of the statement. You can almost just blurt out the word maintainability, and chances are you're going to be right. Because that's why we as software developers do so many things to make it more maintainable. Why do we document our code? Well, for maintainability. Why uh, do we indent our code properly? Well, because of maintainability. And so on down the line. All right? Um, so therefore, um, why do we write functions instead of just having a big, long line of code? Well, for maintainability. If we ever have to do that piece of functionality again, we have a neat little component that we can use. This is the name of the function, and again, or method. Any application we write, there has to be at least one class that has a main method. These string arguments are a way to pass information to this program when we run it. So I could, for example, create a Hello World application where I typed in Java Hello World Mike and it would say, hello world, this is Mike, or whatever name I typed in. So that's what these arguments are. These, are. these are ways for you, when you run the program, to pass parameters into the program. All right. We generally won't use those. Just know that they have to be there. The word string is capitalized. What do we know about string, therefore? It is a class, right? So string is a class. We know that right off the bat because string is capitalized. Look at everything else in this little program. Other than the stuff in quotes, which doesn't really count, all right? And other than the stuff in comments, which doesn't really count, the only things that are capitalized are hello world, which is a class, string, which is a class, and finally system, which is a class. Repeat that, please. Yeah, that's a comment, right. OK. So these are optional command line arguments. So when we run this, we could pass data in if we wanted to. OK, we have a comment. We then have system.out.println. What this is, this is a class. This is an object. We'll talk about the difference between a class and an object in future lectures. And this is a function. How do I know this is a function? I know because I'm a smart guy and I've been doing Java programming for years. Well, besides that, how do I know, just at a glance, that that's a function? Yes? Because it's followed by parentheses. Function calls are, are followed by a list of arguments. So in this case, when we say system out print ln, this is the function that we use to output something to the screen. So that's what outputted it to our default output, which is in our case the, the, the screen. Well, what is it that we're outputting? We're outputting the words hello world. And therefore, that is what is, that's what we want the function to work on is this. All right, notice two things. Uh, or notice uh, an addition, uh, well, let's notice a couple of things. First of all, every statement ends with a semicolon. There's a statement and ends with a semicolon. The other thing is that we use braces to group stuff. So we have braces that group the function together. So this brace goes with this brace. It's nested. 
Everything between this brace and this brace is part of the function. We also have braces around the entire class that says everything from here to here is what makes up the class hello world. Okay? All right. Let's talk about common errors. All right. And again, this is a small program, so that's good. That will help us find our errors more quickly. But if I was going to identify the most common errors, number one, I would say, is the cases, not getting the cases correct. So for example, if I were to do this, whoops, public class and I would put in a capital C. And you know what? This is actually a horrible font for Java programming because look how close the C, uppercase C and lowercase C look. So I'm going to go and change the font to, I guess it doesn't matter. Ah, that's much better much obvi more obvious with this font that the lowercase c and the uppercase c are different. So I'm going to save this and I'm going to recompile it. Now remember I said I, you can use the arrow key so you don't have to retype. If I type, if I hit the top or the upward arrow key it brings up my last command. If I hit the up arrow key again it brings up the next to last command. If I hit it again, it brings the next to next to last command. So you don't have to type in, and this is especially nice when you have like long class names and you know you, you want to get it right once and not worry about it. So I'm going to go, and, and I've deliberately made that error. Let me make sure I've saved it. And I go and compile it. And notice a couple things, all right? I made one character bad and I got three errors. That's important to remember that if you see 65 errors, that doesn't mean that you have 65 things wrong. All right? You might have a few things wrong and each of those things itself is causing a bunch of errors. So don't panic too hard if you see a high number of errors. Okay, that's one thing. Second thing is, is you have to take the error messages that the compiler gives you with a little bit of grain of salt. It would be great if the compiler said, hey, you're not supposed to capitalize the word class, it's supposed to be lowercase. But it doesn't. All right, that's not how compilers work. This is a computer program, right? What it tells me is it tells me, hey, if I say something's public, it needs to be either a class with a lowercase c, an interface, or an enumeration. Yes? That's the line number that it's on. Right. And a lot of editors, that's an excellent point. Uh, a lot of editors will tell you that. Um, if you turn on the status bar, yep, line 20 is where the error is. So that's a great observation. Uh, but again, this gives us an error on 20, 22, and 25. So it tells me that it's expecting a class, an interface, or an enumeration. And you might look at that and say, well, I have a class. Again. Whenever something is like, well, that's what I typed in, sort of have in the back of your mind, yeah, but is the case correct? Because class with a capital C and class with a lowercase c are different in Java. Second thing is, is I can't create a method if I haven't defined a class. So that's why it's complaining about that. Secondly, if I haven't started the class correctly, I can't end the class correctly, so it's complaining about that as well. So, if I make that one correction and save it, 
I'm back in business. So one thing to look at, besides like spelling, right? Like, you know, if I forgot the E in system, for example. All right, let's see what error that would give us. It tells us that package SYSTM doesn't exist. Well, that's actually a fairly straightforward problem, right? I mean, it tells us that there's no such thing as SYSTM. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I spelled system wrong. What if I've capitalized the O in out? Let's capitalize the O and the P. I'm pushing it. We're, we're on the edge. All right. Only gave us one error, even though there's two things were wrong. Why is that? Well, because it doesn't know about anything called OUT, so it sort of ignores the rest of the statement. So this can be frustrating in Java if you correct one error. Yeah, in other words, it doesn't know what capital O-U-T is. So if it doesn't know what it is, it doesn't know anything about the rest of the line either. So it doesn't tell me there's no such thing as print LN, because it doesn't even know where to look for print LN. And so now it went and it, it doesn't know anything about print LN with an uppercase P. Good question. Well, if I delete a bracket. It tells us reached end of file while parsing. Not a very descriptive message, but if you see this error message, what it's telling you is it hit the end unexpectedly. Well, what does that mean unexpectedly? It, you know, is it like me? We, you know, we hit the end of summer unexpectedly. It's like, oh, I can't believe I have to go into work tomorrow. No, it's a different kind of unexpected. It was expecting to see some other characters and it didn't see them. So we hit the end of the file, and it's like, well, I don't know why we hit the end of the file. I'm expecting more. I haven't heard the end. And what do I mean by the end? That last brace. Giving it a cliffhanger, right. Now, what if I have an extra brace? It tells us error, class, interface, or enum expected on line 27. That's kind of a confusing error, all right? Because I know all I did is I added an extra brace. What that means is, is after you end one class, the only thing you could possibly do would be to create another class, create another interface, or to create an enumeration. And therefore, if it's anything else other than that, it's going to complain. Well, it is something other than that. It's another brace. All right, there we go. All right, I want to do enough for you to get your homework done. And I'm sure you want me to do that too. All right. So your homework involves creating a Mad Lib. And you all probably maybe did those Mad Libs when you were a kid where you have a story and there's blanks and you fill in the blanks. You, you, ask, you ask a person like for a noun, for a color, and for a verb. And you don't tell them like where it fits in. And they give you a, a name, a, a color, and a verb. You then read back the story with those words plugged in, and hilarity ensues. All right? So we're going to do something similar to that. In order to do that, we need to be able to do two things. We need to be able to create an array of things. An array is a list. Are there any of you that don't know what an array is? All right? An array is a list of things. So let's create a, an, a list of names. All 
always got to look this up. All right, I was right. So, there I've created a list of four names. All right. How would I print out the first name on the list? You're close. What would I put here? Let's say I want to say hello, Mike. I would put what? String is a type of data, so I wouldn't put string there. I'd put the name of the variable, which is this. So I would say names. Then I refer to which item in the list that I want. All right. So hello plus names sub zero. Now you number the items in the list starting with zero. So this is item zero. This is item one. This is item two. This is item three. So a list with four items, the items are numbered 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this would tell me, hello, Mike. Let's test it. I'm going to get, I'm going to save this. Compile it. And run it. The down arrow, by the way, takes you down through the list of commands. And it says, sure enough, hello, Mike. Well, if I want to say hello, Joyce. What would I change? Zero becomes a three. I still want someone from the names list. I just don't want name number zero. I want name three. choice. All right. Now, that wouldn't be a very fun mad lib if it simply gave you, if you hard coded the numbers in, right? We want to randomly pick, pick a value. How do you randomly pick a number? Well, I think someone had this question, had this answer, when I asked how do you know how to, to, to install the JDK? You Google it. Right. So let's say Java generate random number. The interesting thing is, is if you read this Java random number, it's actually controversial. You'll see people argue for pages uh, about this. Of course, that's probably not that big of a deal because you see people on the internet arguing for pages about anything. Who's better, Team Valor or Team Instinct or Team? Uh, team Mystic, you know, so that really doesn't matter. For, uh, do I, will I give extra credit for being Team Mystic in this class? I don't know. We'll have to see how, how the, the grading works. Okay. All right. This is as good a way as any. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go a little bit long in lecture today, all right, if you haven't figured that out yet. But I do think it's important that you have enough to do um, your assignment. Now, what this does, and again,
this generates a number from 0 to 0.9999999. To get a number between 0 and 3, I can take this and multiply it by 4. So this will give me a number when I multiply 0 to 0 0.9999, I will get a number between 0 and 3.99999. I'm then saying make it an integer and that will give me a value from 0 to 3. Yes. If I simply say make it an integer, it will truncate it. And now, I don't specify that I want element 3. I want element random. So I can save that. Compile it run it, run it first time I get hello Joyce, run it second time hello Joe, hello Joyce, hello Joe, whoops, hello Joyce, hello Mike, starting to worry there, all right. That is something you should test by the way and that's something that's actually tricky to test if you have an application like a game or something like that that is returning random stuff, you want to make sure that it's really returning random stuff and that, that you know, it, there's not some glitch in there that's, that's giving you a certain, you know, is giving you a certain card more often than other cards if you're talking about a card game or a certain roll of the dice more common than that and so on. All right. I do want to spend a minute to look at these two statements before we finish. These two statements declare variables, all right? Two different kinds of variables. This is a string array. A variable declaration, though, they all look the same. They have the type of variable that it is, the name of the variable, and then optionally some initialization. So I'm creating a variable called names, which is an array or list of strings, and it contains these four strings. Here I'm creating an integer named random, and this value equals this expression, where I take a random number between 0 and 0.9 repeating, multiply it by 4, and truncate that and I use that to display the item of the list. We create a variable so that we can go and use it later on in some expressions. This basically is what you need to do for your first lab. You need to create an, a, a Mad Lib where you have um, a poem, a song lyric, a joke, whatever that you fill in the blanks for based on certain values. All right, and you randomly choose those values from an array list. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? It is. That's not my, I, I, I hate to do that. But they're, that, they did that. Um, they did that in their example. But I usually like to keep it right up on it. Um, no more than, you know, between eight and ten pages. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, a few lines is sufficient, you know. Um, it's not like, you know, we're writing a book or anything, you know, like a three-liner. Um, what did I do in the example? Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, or something like that. You know, that's like two or three lines, or, you know, you could break it up into two or three lines. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be long at all. Yes? Um, the array size, good question. Um, I don't know if I said, but a reasonable number, a number where it, it gives for plenty of amusing possibilities. I'm trying to think. 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do a cliffhanger myself. All right? Someone used the word cliffhanger. This is a cliffhanger. I used to love the TV show Alias because, like, every week, like, right before the end of the show, it looked like the main character was about to die, right? And then, like, you look the next week and you see in the TV guide, well, there's a full episode. If they're going to die, it would be a five-minute episode and they'd do commercials for the last 55 minutes. So you know they somehow get out of the predicament, but still it was a cliffhanger, right? What if I were to add someone to the list? What would this program do now? Would it crash? N yeah, it wouldn't crash. It would just never give me Pete. Now, if I did this, if I got rid of Pete and Joyce, then what would it do? It might crash, because it might ask for the fourth member of the list when there's only three members. So. If I add or delete a person from this list, I have to change this. All right? As a programmer, that should raise a red flag. All right? Because it would be better that if I added something to the list, all I have to do is add it to the list and I'll be done with it. Here we have to go and make the change in two place. I have to add it to the list. I have to adjust this number. What could we do? And more importantly, what would be the Java syntax to do it to make it so that to add someone or delete someone for the list, all I would have to do is add them from the list. See if you can figure that out for Monday. We'll talk about that on Monday. And if you can do your program that way, better still. All right? But we'll talk about that on Monday. All right? Are there any other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.